This video is part two in a two-part series. You can watch part one by clicking the link on the top right of your screen. The Turkish nationalists, under the leadership of Mustafa Kemal, have just defeated both the Armenians and the French, but neither were nearly as much of a threat to the young Turkey as Greece. Whereas everyone before the Greeks could only muster armies of tens of thousands of troops, the Greek Field Army of Asia Minor, or FAAM, was swelling to over 200,000, and they were all about to march on the nationalist capital at Ankara. The nationalists knew that the final battle was approaching, so they did all they could to prepare for it. Their most important act was signing the Treaty of Moscow with the Soviets. This treaty meant that the Soviets would start shipping massive amounts of desperately needed weapons to the nationalists. But before any of those weapons could arrive, the Greeks made their move. But first, this video was sponsored by Blinkist. Blinkist is the app that gives you the most important information from over 5,500 nonfiction books and podcasts in just 15 minutes. It's a great way to widen your knowledge on a variety of topics without wasting your valuable time. Blinkist's massive library covers 27 different categories of topics. And since it's all audio, you can listen to it while you exercise, commute, or even when you just want to relax. So Blinkist fits perfectly into your busy lifestyle. Their catalog of 5,500 titles includes books that we've covered on this channel. So if you've always wanted to know more about Karl von Clausewitz's On War, Sun Tzu's The Art of War, or Alexander Solzhenitsyn's Gulag Archipelago, but don't have the time to read them yourself, let Blinkist do the hard work for you, while you go on living your life. They even have some fiction options like George Orwell's 1984. And now, Blinkist is introducing their newest feature, Blinkist Connect. Blinkist Connect allows every premium plan to be shared between two different accounts at no additional cost. And while the accounts are kept totally separate, you can share your favorite summaries between the linked accounts, helping to share valuable knowledge with your friends. So click the link in the description to start your 7-day free trial and get 25% off your premium membership. Doing so really supports our channel. And now, back to the video. On March 23, 1921, the Greeks attempted their first major offensive since the reconnaissance in force. After some initial success, their army exhausted itself and was forced to retreat from the nationalist counterattacks. This made clear to the Greeks that they needed to strengthen their army, so they mobilized 58,000 native Greeks, plus another 12,000 Ottoman Greeks from occupied Anatolia. By the end of June, the FAAM had over 200,000 men. The next Greek offensive would pit 126,000 Greeks against 122,000 nationalists, although it should be noted that the Greeks had a significant advantage in equipment. The only thing the nationalists had going for them was the fact that their 5,000 cavalry were more numerous than the Greeks' 1,000. The Greek advance began at 6 a.m. on July 10th, taking 40 kilometers in three days. This time, they didn't just keep their gains, but the Greeks even came close to encircling a significant portion of the nationalist army. If this encirclement was completed, it could win the war for the Greeks right then and there. The nationalists frantically launched counterattacks to screen their retreat, which was just barely enough to allow their forces to escape, but they had to leave significant amounts of equipment behind them in the process. Luckily for the nationalists, the Greeks had once again exhausted themselves, and the logistics were starting to fail, so they weren't pursued. Both sides suffered around 8,000 casualties here, but the nationalists were the overall losers due to the massive amounts of lost equipment and the desertion of 30,000 men. While this was a massive Greek victory, it should have been more. The Greeks had a real opportunity to break the nationalist army, but many of their operations were poorly organized and led. It's almost like they shouldn't have fired all of those competent officers for political reasons. The Greek advance and near annihilation of the nationalist army caused chaos back in Ankara. People and politicians alike thought that the Greeks were about to take the city. Here, Mustafa Kemal's skill as a leader really shone through. He convinced the Council of Ministers not to abandon the city, and to make him the commander-in-chief. He used this power to totally reorganize the army's senior leadership. While the nationalists were panicking, the Greeks were elated. Their army was on the brink of its final offensive, one designed to finally, finally destroy the nationalist army. The Greek plan was to begin with a decoy attack in the north, which would distract from their main thrust in the south. In theory, this could encircle the nationalists, but the intent was more to smash through and destroy their army by attrition. 
For this offensive, the Greek army had 77,000 infantry, 1,380 cavalry, 684 machine guns, and 296 artillery. This was against the Nationalists' 93,000 infantry, 3,342 cavalry, 742 machine guns, and 168 artillery. The Greek advance began on August 1, 1921. This advance saw them take 20 miles a day for a full week, but failed to make contact with the main Nationalist force. The Nationalists figured out that the attacks in the north were a distraction, so redirected soldiers to the south, but there was only so much that could do for them. The constant battering of the Nationalist army used up all of their reserves, and by August 30th, the Nationalists were in critical condition. The Greek plan seemed to be working. But all of the long-distance fighting and advances left the FAAM exhausted, forcing it to briefly halt. The Nationalists used this reprieve to shore up their defenses. As bad as the situation looked for the Nationalists, the Greeks weren't doing much better. The Nationalist army was supposed to be destroyed by now, but their constant retreats made it impossible for the Greeks to fully defeat them, and stretch the Greek supply lines further and further. When the Greeks recuperated, they resumed their offensive, pushing to within 70 miles of Ankara by September 2nd. But the Nationalist army was still intact. In fact, by now, it was the Greeks who were getting the worst of the fighting. According to the concise Greek history of the conflict, the constant and dedicated enemy resistance contesting every meter of ground, the significant reduction in strength due to losses, the inability to replace them, as well as the problem of supply, finally provoked serious concern. It became increasingly clear to the Greeks that they would neither destroy the Nationalist army nor take Ankara. Nearly half of their trucks were immobilized by breakdowns and lack of spare parts. The remaining Greek offensives were no longer directed to destroying the Nationalist army, but to securing their path of retreat. By September 6th, the Greek offensives ended, and the army assumed defensive positions. This was the closest the Greeks ever got to winning the war. It was now time for the Nationalist counterattack. The Greek army was positioned in a salient, making it easy to encircle, which is exactly what the Nationalists tried to do, but the Greeks were prepared and made a skillful retreat. They were outside of the Nationalist army's reach by September 13th. By the 26th, the Battle of Sakaria, as it would come to be known, ended in a Turkish victory. Each side suffered around 22,000 casualties. After Sakaria, the Nationalists attempted their own offensive against the Greeks, but just as the Greeks had overextended themselves to attack the Nationalists, here the Nationalists overextended themselves to attack the Greeks. After the attack failed, winter set in, putting an end to military operations for the year. Historian Michael Llewellyn Smith described this period as the Winter of Disenchantment. Greek military leaders knew that their position was untenable, but they couldn't do anything about it without the approval of their political leaders, who, rather than fixing the military situation, decided to seek a diplomatic solution. On March 21st, 1922, the Allies attempted to make peace between the Greeks and the Nationalists, but they had no success. By the way, the Ottomans tried joining these negotiations, but by now they were so unimportant that the request was outright ignored. It was at around this point that the Greek economy began to collapse, so in their desperation created a forced loan in the form of half of all the drachma in circulation. This raised 1.5 billion drachma for the government, but upset pretty much everyone in the process. All the while, the FAAM's requests to retreat were being ignored. The Turkish nationalists were happy to watch all of this and wait. After all, while the Greeks were getting weaker, they were becoming stronger. An additional 120,000 soldiers were mobilized, with some even being trained in the tactics of German stormtroopers. Weapons continued to arrive from the Soviet Union, and an increasingly efficient war economy was developing. It even included women who participated in production and transport. And, surprisingly, their former French and Italian enemies started selling them weapons, the import of which the Greeks couldn't stop with their navy because the Allies refused to recognize Greece as being in a state of war. The Nationalist plan to end the war was ambitious. Time and time again, each army tried to encircle the other but failed. This would be the most serious attempt of the war. If successful, it would be one of the few cases of large-scale military encirclements before World War II. But if anyone could pull it off, it was the Turkish Army of 1922. It was composed of nearly 200,000 men, over 15,000 of whom were mounted. They were veteran soldiers led by experienced and well-educated officers. Their operation would be known as the Great Offensive. At 5 a.m. on August 26th, the battle began with a precise artillery bombardment, followed by a well-planned infantry assault. The next day, the Greek front was broken, and the Nationalists began their encirclement. 
infantry held the Greek army in place as cavalry closed in around their flanks. By the 29th, a portion of the Greek army was trapped. On the 30th, the nationalists came close to liquidating the pocket with infantry assaults. The encircled Greeks, around 20,000 men by this point, made a breakout attempt along a road the Turks didn't fully control. Roughly 5,000 managed to escape, while the nationalists captured a different 5,000 on the morning of the 31st. At this moment, it became clear to everyone that the nationalists had won the war. Kamal commanded his soldiers, Armies, your first goal is the Mediterranean. Forward. The Greeks were in a panic, sacked their commanders, and tried to appoint new ones. But they found out that the man they wanted to appoint as the head of the FAAM had already been captured by the nationalists. The nationalists chased the Greeks all the way to the Mediterranean, prompting Greeks and Armenians to flee en masse. Amidst the chaos, the city of Smyrna caught fire. This fire is the source of much controversy, with Armenians, Greeks, and Turks all blaming each other. The fire killed between 10 and 100,000 people. The city itself lacked the ability to put it out, while the nationalist army did little to stop it. All throughout the war, ethnic conflict and atrocities against civilians were common. But during this retreat, it was particularly bad. Western Anatolia was devastated. The nationalists claimed that this was the result of a Greek scorched earth campaign, while the Greeks say it was a campaign of Turkish reprisals. The nationalists then moved troops north into the Dardanelles. They weren't going to leave any part of Anatolia in foreign hands. Back in Greece, the volatile political situation exploded. Angry military leaders launched a coup that successfully overthrew the government. The revolutionaries then immediately splintered between hardliners and moderates. The only immediate outcome was the execution and life imprisonment of the previous government's ministers. The Turkish War of Independence would be ended with the Treaty of Lausanne. The nationalists got pretty much everything they wanted. It forced the Greeks out of Anatolia, and returned eastern Thrace and Istanbul to the Turks. The only issues it didn't cover were the status of Mosul and Hatay province, the latter of which the Turks would get back in 1939. The final issue to deal with was the forced population exchange between Greece and Turkey. One million Greeks and 350,000 Muslims were forcibly exchanged between the two countries. This makes it sound like the Greeks suffered more, but it should be noted that over the course of Greece's expansion in the last century, around 250,000 Muslims were forced to relocate to Turkey. At the end of the day, this was, as historian Sarah Shields put it, internationally administered ethnic cleansing. For the Greeks, this war was their national catastrophe. Ever since securing its independence in 1821, and with the help of its Western allies, the modern Greek state continuously expanded into historically and ethnically Greek territories, all with the goal of eventually achieving the Magali idea. This war put an end to that dream forever. It was the first in a long line of disasters for Greece, ranging from economic woes, foreign occupations, civil wars, and financial crises. For the Turks, this was their redemption their rebirth from a dying monarchy to a modern, secular nation-state. They would always love the man who led them to this, Mustafa Kemal, granting him the name Ataturk, Father of the Turks. He is revered in Turkey to this day. And that's the Turkish War of Independence. Both parts of this two-part series were based on the Turkish War of Independence, a military history, by Edward J. Erickson. It's a truly excellent history of the conflict. I link to where you can pick it up, and to the rest of our sources in the description below this video. This video was funded by our supporters on Patreon and elsewhere, including Josiah, and by this video's sponsor, Blinkist. Links to Blinkist and where you can support us directly are also in the description. Like, comment, and subscribe for more. I'll see you next time.